Five button. Oh ho ho! We are live. Hey y'all. Hi. Hey Kev, what's up? I'm I was over here on YouTube trying to see if uh, I actually saw us go live. Hey, there we are. It's happening. Joe Rogan is moving to Spotify, and now we're moving into his world. <laughs> Taking over <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> uh I wonder if it's got the the delay on Facebook. Nope. There it is. Sweet. Awesome. What, and Facebook are good too. Yeah, Facebook Live is good too. Rock Let's on. check the audio this week because last week we had some lag. Anybody could check that. This is uh, this is a precarious thing I'm to gonna, check. I'm gonna mute my mic for a second and listen. Okay. So this is just a sound check for Kevin to hear. Um, how are we doing on the audio? Are we doing okay? For everybody who's watching this and going, wow, this is unprofessional. Well, <laughs> this is the first time we've ever used StreamYard. We're doing our best. All right. You know, we're not the we're not the JRE experience <laughs> just yet. Awesome. We got some shout outs on YouTube. All right. Hey from Thank Kenya. Eric. So that is sweet. awesome. Buzzsprout Rocks. Thank you, local business Whoa. marketing solutions. Wait, Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Nice. Very nice. There's Eric and Henry. What's going on, Henry? Local business marketing, Buzzsprout Rocks. All right. Oh, Dax says that our audio is awesome. That's so encouraging. All right. Take number three. All right. What are we talking about today? Travis, you want to do a little intro and get us going in this, this podcast episode? Yes, absolutely. Let's do it. Welcome back to Buzzcast, live stream edition number two. We are trying to up our production quality every single time. So last year was kind of a jerry-rigged solution. This this time, we're going full stream yard, right, Kevin? Walk yeah. us through the whole stream yard when, when setup. Last year, I think. <laughs> yeah, too. last year. Not like all a year the, ago. All this, all this isolation is getting to me. I, all my years are running together now. Right. So we're, we continue to test live stream and multi-stream platforms. And this week we are on StreamYard. So far, so good. Um, we were testing. It took us about 30 minutes to get it so that everyone's mic didn't have any latency and the feedback in our own headphones. This trick there was to turn off the little audio processing checkbox on my side, which I was like the main host. And from there, everything seems to be working pretty good. So we're live in our Facebook group. We're live on our YouTube channel. And we are going to record this week's episode of Buzzcast. We're going to talk about, well, I don't know. Travis is going to go through the agenda in a second. He's going to open the show and start us off. It is a very news. Oh, I thought I already did. I thought that was the whole welcome to Buzzcast thing. Oh, did you already do that? Yeah. <laughs> I missed it. That's all right. That's okay. No. So what I like about StreamYard, uh, getting the train back on the tracks, uh, is that with the last solution that we had, we were using Ecamm Live. Um, you could not bring in the comments from the different platforms you were streaming to in the same dashboard. So you kind of had to have like a couple windows open all at once. And so with StreamYard though, it just brings them directly in so we can see Facebook comments, we can see YouTube comments, and we can do some stuff on the screen uh, that is pretty cool. Kevin was already showing some comments on the video and kind of highlighting different people. And so that was cool. So it seems like a pretty robust solution if you want to do an interactive podcast, if you want to do a live Q&A episode or something like that. Um, we'll keep using it. We'll keep seeing if this is something we want to keep doing. But uh, we will continue to be guinea pigs for you guys. This episode is pretty news heavy, mainly because there's been a lot of really big news, especially recently. Um, we're recording this on a Wednesday. Yesterday, Tuesday, May 19th, the foundations of the podcasting world were shaken, <laughs> so to speak, in that the news came out that Joe Rogan has signed an exclusive deal to move his YouTube channel, essentially, and his entire podcast archive to become a Spotify exclusive by the end of the year. So we have a lot of thoughts about this. Uh, Albin, why don't you kind of kick this off? Because I know you've been doing a deep dive. Uh, you were actually the first person that I knew that kind of broke the news that this was happening. And so what have you heard in like the, the podcasting uh, community so far? Yeah. So I think it's good just to lay out the exactly what we know about the deal so far. Um, so Joe Rogan came out, said podcast is moving to Spotify. 
September by September, they're going to have the entire 11 year backlog of episodes. That's all going to be on Spotify. And then by the end of the year, so sometime a little bit before 2021, the show and the video. So everything on YouTube will be exclusive to Spotify. And that's a pretty big deal. We're talking millions of views on YouTube, millions of downloads per episode. Um, Joe Rogan experience is considered by many to be the number one podcast in the world. Maybe not everyone's favorite podcast in the world, but it's definitely the largest. He gets the most downloads per episode. Um, so it's a really big win for Spotify to be able to do that. Um, this is coming from somebody who for years said, you know, it's all smoke and mirrors over there at Spotify. You don't make enough money when you stream with them. And uh, the deal that at least the details of the deal that we've seen uh, make it look like you make a ton of money when you move to Spotify if you're Joe Rogan. So he, it's a multiple year licensing deal. So Spotify is not buying the Joe Rogan experience. They are just going to be the exclusive um, provider of the show for multiple years. We don't know how many multiple years. So it's more like when Netflix licenses friends than when they create their own show or buy a show. Um, the money side of it is somewhere north of $100 million. That's what the Wall Street Journal posted. And then I've seen um, another source that said it's probably going to be closer to $200 million by the time that it all pans out. So it's a lot of money and it's definitely signaling a huge change for the podcasting industry. Why don't you jump in, Kevin? What are your thoughts? Uh, oh, so Alvin gets to cover the news and I have to start with the opinions. Well, is, is there any news that you have heard that's uh, to kind of complement that? Um, no, that, that was super accurate. A good summary of what's happening. What's, what's one of the things that's really interesting that's not opinion based um, is I, I think you guys tell me if I'm wrong because I don't I don't participate in the Spotify world. But I think this is going to be their first foray into video, right? Like as of now, they don't really have any video on their platform at all. Yeah, they had about, started. Go ahead, go ahead, Alvin. Yeah, about a week ago, I think, or maybe a couple weeks ago, they tested some video stuff, and then I'm pretty sure James Cridlin from Pod News asked them about it, and they were like, "Yeah, or, well, I don't know." <laughs> like they just didn't say anything, and then now we they, know they test. They there were testing some video stuff on the platform and people are kind of like, Hey, are you guys going to try to do video? And now we know starting September and then eventually by the end of the year, there's going to be exclusive video on Spotify from Joe. And that's a pretty big deal. Um, you know, I've seen lots of people try to say, Hey, they're trying to move into the YouTube space. That's a pretty big hill to climb, but it's pretty it's a pretty big deal that they're going to do video now. Yeah. So technically what's, I imagine what's going to happen is the JRE podcast is no longer going to have an RSS feed. doesn't need one. I imagine um, that we all know who Joe, the JRE podcast is hosted with. It's not going to live on a traditional podcast host anymore. I'm assuming that all that back catalog is going to get moved over to Spotify servers. And then they wouldn't need an RSS feed. They would just serve it up straight from there. He's probably going to get a lot of promotion within Spotify. So when you launch Spotify, his face is probably going to be all over as you're browsing, probably browsing music or browsing podcasts. And they're going to do everything they can to preserve and build the audience for the JRE show. So one of the things that um, we've talked about before is like, when does a podcast stop becoming a podcast? And it becomes something different. And one of the, one of the terms that we use for it at Buzzsprout is we call them shows. Like if it's not, if it doesn't fit our definition of podcast. And so a lot of people have been talking about that in the different podcasting groups. Is this still a podcast or is it not? It's really, you know, I mean, it's, it can be fun to talk about that stuff. It doesn't really matter to the world at large. The, um, most people who are not in the podcasting industry or running podcasting themselves, that doesn't matter to them. What matters to them is this something that I listen to and do I call it a podcast? Like my, my children say all the time that I listen to podcasts on YouTube. And again, that we, I wouldn't fit our definition of a podcast, but to them it is. Um, 
And so well, anyway, all that to say is I, I'm not so so interested in that conversation as much as, as as I am like what does this mean for the podcasting world? Not the strict definition of doesn't need to have an RSS feed to be a podcast, but what does it mean for this ecosystem of people who are creating audio and video content and putting it out to the world? Independent creators, Joe Rogan, even though he's a big name and a bit of a celebrity, he still is an independent podcaster. Like he's not going to work for Spotify. He's not an employee. He's somebody who created something on his own. And now he got a really good licensing deal. Um, so I'd still consider him an independent <clears throat> podcaster, even though I might not technically say that this is a podcast anymore. Yeah, I think it's valuable to kind of think through what the incentives are for all the parties involved. So, I mean, on the Spotify side, Spotify forever has really not liked the, I mean, I doubt they really enjoy the economics of music, the way that the music industry is set up, the more that you stream, the more that the artist makes. And so Spotify doesn't love it because you pay them a fixed fee. And then if you use the app more then they're paying out more money they would prefer to own the content or have content they don't pay anybody anything for. And for a long time, that's been podcasts. They moved into the podcast space and everyone was excited because they were growing the podcasting listener base so much. Everyone wanted to put their shows there, which were the interests were aligned because Spotify was like, hey, when we don't have to pay for it. Um, you know, but they started late enough that even now when they have really, really good um they get a ton of plays in Asia, South America, a lot of places that are really podcasting is blown up in the last few years, a lot heavier Spotify usage than Apple usage. Um, but in the States, Apple is completely dominant. And what they're doing is they're actually just grabbing some of these top shows. So they've also bought the ringer. They've also bought Gimlet. They also, have an exclusive deal with um, last podcast on the left and a couple, one other show. Well, they're negotiating with the Obamas as well with their new media network to have exclusive rights to whatever audio they create. Yeah. So Barack Obama is a pretty big celebrity. You um, may have heard of him. <laughs> they, uh, so they're, they're doing all that because you're only really going to have one podcast player. And if you're one of the like 11 million people that download every Joe Rogan experience, it's not a podcast, it's an experience. Um, then you, you're going to have to flip over to Spotify and it's another app. And you may already have that app because you listen to music. Um, but the whole play is to get all these listeners off of Apple podcasts, off of overcast, off of podcast addict, you know, whatever app you're on and into Spotify so that they really can start to pull this entire industry together. Um, on the Joe Rogan side, it's, I don't see any way that this does not decrease his reach. Now his reach may grow over the next three or four years while he's on Spotify, but it will not grow as much as it was growing or could grow as an independent. Um, the great thing about podcasting and that it's open is you've got your you're growing a world on YouTube, you're growing your RSS feed, you're growing it in multiple apps, you have all these different places for people to engage. Now that it's locked up inside of Spotify, you know, I probably will not listen to the Joe Rogan experience. I used to go through and download a couple episodes if there was an interesting guest, but I'm not going to, you know, flip over to a new app to do that. Um, so it is limiting his audience. The thing that Joe gets out of it is like a dump truck of money. So uh, that's the real benefit for him. Yeah. Yeah. And especially when you think about the video element, because they're going to be bringing the video over as well. Um, how many people that watch, how many of the 10 million people that watch the latest Elon Musk interview on YouTube are going to say, oh, I want to watch that video interview. Let me go watch it on my Spotify app on my phone. So I think that's really where it's going to hit him the most because it's more of a shift in your behavior of how you're consuming that content. Uh, and then I definitely agree that in the short term, especially there's going to be a lot of pushback similar to whenever Facebook rolls out a change to their dashboard or their newsfeed and everybody's up in arms about, we want the old Facebook back and there's all this hubbub and uproar. And then three months later, people get used to it. So I definitely think there's going to be a, a seismic shift probably on the order of magnitude of 80% of his audience, not following him to Spotify. Uh, and then over time, 
try and get that back. Well, there's some parallels, right? Like uh, Howard Stern moving to XM. Serious. Seri what well, used to be XM, right? XM Sirius. <laughs> Sirius XM. Sat satellite radio. <laughs> satellite radio. Whatever the kids call it. Uh, and I imagine I, I don't have any research on this. It would be interesting to look up, but I imagine uh, his his audience dropped dramatically. But it was still a win for him because he got his truckloads of money, and still a win for Sirius because they were drawing in enough people of his fan base. Again, it might've been a, a per small percentage of his fan base, but enough to justify what they were paying him in new subscriptions. So I'm sure everyone at Spotify and the Joe Rogan team are smart enough to have worked all these numbers through and uh, it's going to be a win for them. What's what I think that is, we need to think about as independent podcasters is what does this mean for independent podcasters? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? As Spotify gets more clout and more um, exclusive content or dominance in the podcasting space, uh, they also start to have a lot of control and power. One thing that independent podcasters don't see that much that we do see as a host is the a number of um, like show takedowns that we get from Spotify every single week. And so right now, if you produce a podcast you use a host like Buzzsprout to put it out. There are dozens and dozens of great podcast apps that you can distribute your content to. If you get booted or banned from any one of those, um, like the smaller third-party independent ones, it's not that big of a hit because your content is still widely available in these lots of other places. Uh, obviously, it's a big hit right now if you were to get booted or bumped from Apple Podcasts because they were the dominant podcast distribution app and consumption app. But Apple Podcasts does not do takedowns like Spotify has been doing takedowns. Spotify has been much more aggressive in curating the content that they'll allow on their platform. Apple has been very passive. Um, and the same with like Google Podcasts and stuff, very passive, not very aggressive. Spotify seems to have shown early on that they are going to be heavy handed in how they uh, curate and manage the podcast and the content that are distributed on their platform, which is a scary combination with how quickly they are becoming a very powerful player in the podcasting industry. So they're buying a lot of content and pushing a lot of people into podcast content for the reasons that you guys mentioned earlier, like the, the licensing fees on it are much lower. So they make a lot more money the more time people spend on their platform listening to podcast content versus music. Um, and they're just investing a ton of money in growing the podcasting side of their business and now moving into the video side as well. Um, but it becomes scary, right? Because if they don't like what you're talking about, they can kick you off your platform. So if you build your whole audience around uh, what Spotify is doing, um, there's a huge risk there, right? Like that you could get, I mean, on, in the YouTube world, they call it like demonetized but Spotify is not really monetizing anybody yet. They just will boot you. And so that's I, concerning. Yeah. And beyond like some sort of censorship concerns, there's also when there is a platform and it's YouTube is the platform for video online. Everything runs through the lens of, is this good for YouTube? And so when it's, Hey, do we serve up tons of ads in front of the videos? The only thing they're really thinking through is, is this good for YouTube? They're not saying, hey, is PewDiePie happy with me serving up these ads this way? They're even their top creators. They're not, that's not who they're stressed out about. They're stressed out about YouTube. And we're, if we consolidate the entire podcasting industry into a platform, then the podcasting industry is subservient to that platform. It serves the interests of that platform. And so Spotify will be able to make decisions that are not based on, hey, how do we keep a vibrant ecosystem of you know, different business models and different ways for people to make money and different ways for the industry to grow and develop? They're going to go, well, what right now makes the most sense for Spotify? Um, so you, know, you just think of how much diversity there is in written content online that's just built on top of the web browser and HTTP how different that is from something like YouTube or social media that are built for platforms and for their interests. 
Yeah. yeah. And then you couple that with the news that was not so far in the distance past where they rolled out their brand new dynamic ad dashboard for podcasting. Right. And so you can start to see all these pieces come together where they're not only trying to uh, get exclusive rights to some of the bigger podcasts in the world to try and drive new people to sign up for Spotify and choose Spotify as their primary podcast listening app. But then they also want to get on the ad revenue side. They want to become the middleman for all the ad revenue in podcasting. And so if you want to advertise, you know, at least right now, Joe Rogan is maintaining his uh, existing ad strategy of doing host red ads and getting sponsors that way. But you could totally see in the not too distant future, Spotify says, you know what? That's, you know, we're going to renegotiate this deal. You're now using our dynamic ad platform and we're taking a 30% cut because that's the cost of playing on Spotify. Uh, that makes sense for Spotify. If they have all of this attention and all this traffic and all these people listening to podcast episodes and they have the ability to dynamically target and insert ads to try and get you to spend money so that they can make money, that is a win for Spotify, even at the expense of the entire podcasting ecosystem. Yeah, and that is the only way that this deal makes sense for Spotify. I think it's good to go back to Kevin's um, example with Howard Stern and Sirius XM, that when he signed that deal, the whole thing that was in it for Sirius was, hey, nobody really is doing this whole um, listening to, uh, you know, online, whatever, satellite radio. <laughs> that thing, <laughs> no, that thing. Satellite radio yet. But maybe if we bring the million people, which is about what it was, who listen to Howard Stern every day and make them buy this extra hardware and set up this up and get a subscription, then maybe we'll start having a viable business model because we will bring all that together. And after they did that was when I think they merged with XM and then they had one single uh, platform. Spotify wants to do that. They're not buying Joe Rogan for hundreds of millions of dollars because they think, hey, the 11 million downloads he gets are going to make us so much money in ads that we actually will make out on this deal. It's not a, they're not doing that. They are saying, we're going to move the 11 million people that listen to Joe every month off of another platform onto Spotify. And then when this deal runs out in four, you know, in four years or whatever it will be, they will still be here. And if Joe moves back to his old host and his old feed, even then when he's doing that, it will, they will still stay on Spotify. And then they will have the ability to run dynamic ads around the podcast. And, um, you know, that way they're able to bring everything together. Yeah. So the only way it makes sense for them is if their goal is to try to win and they're trying to win so that they can be the middleman brokering all the ad deals in the podcasting space and all the content in the podcasting space. Yeah. What happens when these platforms come in and put themselves as a middleman or like a gatekeeper between um, the content that you want to consume and the actual consumer is that the content becomes very devalued because they start to learn who is interested in listening to the uh, Joe Rogan Experience podcast, right? And then even if that podcast leaves, we still know all the people that match the demographic profile for listening to that show and they're listening to other shows or they're listening to other music. So we can still target them the same way. So if an advertiser is willing to pay 30 or $40 CPM to advertise on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, it's not because it's it's not the, the message that Joe's delivering that the advertisers are interested in. It's the demographic profile of the person who's listening to that. And as long as Spotify has the data to be able to target those same people, even if they're listening to different shows, they can sell that same ad at that same CPM to target the same people, even if they're listening to different shows. It's the exact same thing that Google has done and Facebook has done. Uh, it's why their ad, I mean, Facebook and Google are ad businesses, right? And if we look back to the late 90s, early 2000s, when independent blogging was exploding and there was lots of independent publishers like newspapers and you know journalists, journalists who were doing private blogs and stuff, they were creating this amazing content and they were either selling their own ads or there were these independent ad networks that would sell ads on behalf of multiple blogs, right? 
that's very similar to what we have in the podcasting space right now. We might create content. We put it out on a podcast host. It gets distributed. And then we can work ourselves. We can work affiliate deals. We can contact advertisers who we think might be a good fit for our show. Or we can partner up with companies like, you know, Midroll or Art19 or somebody who would sell ads um, just based on like the number of downloads that we get or specific information about our show. And then they take a cut. But there's these different silos of people who work in these independent spaces in the podcasting industry. And it's exactly what it looked like in the early 2000s with blogging. Then Facebook comes along and Google comes along and they start saying, hey, why are you spending $5,000 on that ad on the New York Times website when I can target the same exact people for you and sell it to you for a dollar a click? Wouldn't that be better? And people are like, yeah, I don't want to spend $5,000 for that ad if I, yeah, I can just pay you a dollar a click. That is what has kind of destroyed independent blogs and the whole advertising space around independent content websites like in the blogging world all those people now consume content on facebook and they find it through google and those people have taken all the revenue so the people who create the content are not getting the value out of it that they used to they used to be able to get paid for their work and they really don't anymore they get pen paid pennies on the dollar who gets the, all the money facebook instagram well they're the same company google yeah it's like these conglomerates that come together and they say it's not, they, they, their models devalue the content and devalue the content creator because at the end of the day, all that content is doing is attracting certain people. And if somebody comes along and says, I can target those same people for you for a lot less money than where the advertisers are going to spend their money with the people who can get the same ad in front of those same people for less. Right. And we're not against dynamically inserted or a dynamic insertion technology. It's actually really cool the way it works. The reason that we discourage it so much for podcasters is the math never works out in your favor, like ever. I've never seen a scenario where someone made more money doing dynamically inserted ads, especially if a third party service is taking a cut of that versus if you found your own sponsors, promoted affiliates that you believed in, sold your own products, created a subscription membership like Patreon. There are so many other ways to make more money there is not a single podcast in the universe that benefits from dynamically inserted ads apart from, I just don't want to lift a finger to try and figure this out. You figure it out and just give me whatever nickels are left over. Right. And, and here, here's how it ties back to Spotify is that we don't know exactly what deal Joe signed with Spotify, right? He might very well still do host red ads. He might still be able to sell his own ads outside of Spotify's ad network or he may not, he may have signed that away. It, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that at the end of the day, Spotify determined whatever they inked on paper to be valuable enough because they need to draw more podcast listeners into the Spotify podcasting app. As soon as they get, well, not as soon as, the more listeners they get, the more clout that they get, the more that they connect in people's minds, the idea that when I hear the word podcasting, I think Spotify, the more power that they get. Right. And so then they get to curate shows. They get to say who's in and who's out. They get to say how much ads cost on podcasts, whether they be host read or dynamically inserted. Doesn't really matter. Again, Apple has had a scary amount of power in this place for a long time, has but never did anything super concerning. So it's not like I don't want to feel like we're just picking on Spotify. What we're picking on is that they are um, moving into a very powerful position. They have been for the last year and a half, two years. And all the evidence of the moves that they're making don't look like a pretty happy future. They look like what Facebook looks like. They look like what YouTube looks like. And that's not great for the independent content creators because we've seen what these platforms do. We've seen how Facebook has completely decimated the blogging ecosystem. We see that YouTube has, create, has decimated the online video ecosystem. In terms of the number of creators who can actually get compensated fairly for the content that they provide to this platform, it's it's nothing. It's nothing. There are very few YouTubers that are actually making a good, healthy living off of just the revenue that they generate straight from the platform. But if you look at like Google stock, they're doing great. Look at Facebook stock. They're killing it. So somebody's winning here and somebody's losing and somebody's doing a whole bunch of work but creating all this content. And that's the independent creator. And, and so I think it's worth thinking about. The, the question becomes, 
like, well, what do we do about it as independent podcasters? And I think Joe Rogan, ironically enough, has already given us the answer. <laughs> Joe Rogan, the guy who's just made more money from Spotify than probably anybody in the history of Spotify, never had his shows on Spotify. He withheld his content. And he said, no, I don't like the way that you guys treat independent podcasters and artists and you don't pay them well and all this kind of stuff. And he held out, he held his content off of there, built his audience independently, used uh, JRE clips on Facebook and then posted his own podcast audio through an independent podcast host and distributed it to third party apps and did it that way. And he just got the dump truck full of money. And so I, th I think if you throw your show in there, you're just another, I've said this before, you're another pebble on the pile of giving Spotify the power that they want to win the podcasting space. And none of us should try to win an open, healthy, vibrant ecosystem. We should all figure out how do we encourage uh, the growth of openness and, and keep it open and keep it healthy. Um, as soon as somebody tries to win, like that's the opposite of open. They're going to control it. They're going to close it down. It's going to be a walled garden and you're going to have to play by their rules. That doesn't sound, I mean, that sounds like what happened to blogs and when Facebook came in and crushed them all. Yeah. Podcasting is not a zero sum game. It's not that you have to win at other, someone else's expense. It really is a rising tide lifts all boats uh, kind of thing. So before we shift gears, I want to park on that a little bit as far as seriously considering pulling your content off of Spotify, how would you do that? Let's say that you have 30% of your audience on Spotify right now. And the idea that you're just going to shut that off is, is, you know, can certainly give you some anxiety of, I'm just going to choose to take a moral stand here and lose 30% of my listening audience. Well, um, it's not moral. It's, pr it's a principled stand, right? Sure. It, so it, go ahead. Well, if, if you, and I think everyone should just make their own decision. This is, this is, uh, I'm speaking a lot. This is my opinions. Albin and, and Travis share some of these same opinions, but uh, we haven't had any of the Buzzsprout produced podcasts on Spotify for quite a while. We didn't have them on the beginning and then they switched to pass through and we said, okay, we'll give you a shot. And then they launched this whole, you know, ad targeting campaign and we're touting it and we're like, we don't want our, people who are listening to our shows targeted and profiled. So we pulled it back out. Now they're doing the stuff with um, Jerry. Again, I, I don't fault them for making smart business moves. And if I was a shareholder, I would be very happy because these are smart business moves, but these are business moves that are in the best interest of shareholders, not necessarily my belief, independent podcasters. And so it's, it's, a, I get it. There, there's always a cost for doing something. Like if you agree on principle that what Spotify is doing to the independent podcasters and the future that they're laying out for us is not in, it's not healthy. It's not something I'm super excited about. It's going to cost you something to stand up against that. And it might cost you 30% of your current listeners, but there's still a way to succeed and grow your show outside of that. It might require a little bit more work. It might take a little bit more time, but you can do it. But anything of value, we all know this, right? Anything of value is going to cost something. And so that's the question that I think that we should all struggle with as independent podcasters is, am, am I willing to pay the price um, to slow down what Spotify is trying to do in the podcasting space? And it might be in vain because, you know, just Buzzsprout holding our own podcast out of Spotify, it's not going to change anything. Yeah. Um, if everybody on Buzzsprout held their shows out, that might make, that might make a difference. I mean, Joe Rogan held his content out of Spotify long enough until they were able to fill the truck full of money and drive it over to his house. And so he made a difference, but in the end he caved. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't. If yeah, to be clear, truck of money in my house. I, I, Buzz, Buzzcast will move to Spotify for 100 yeah. million plus. <laughs> no, I get it. Um, but it's, it's something that we should think about because it, if we do love podcasting, we do have our opportunity to make cast our vote. Just like when you're voting for someone in political office, you might not think your vote counts, but we know in the grand scheme of things, it does count. We just, we have to get a movement behind it, right? We've got to get enough people who believe the same things that we do. Yep. So I want to wrap up with the sort of five minute Monday episode, hearkening back to our, our now archived show. Uh, and just give some tips. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, okay, yeah, I don't want to 
you know, be a part of supporting what Spotify is building? How do I transition my audience off of Spotify? Well, the first thing you shouldn't do is just take your podcast off of Spotify. So what you should do is spend the next few weeks, next couple of months saying, hey, guys, we're no longer going to be on Spotify in the near future. If you listen on an Android app, here are some other apps you can download that are actually better for podcast listening. And the links actually work in the show notes and those kind of things. And like teach your audience and show them how to transition off of Spotify before, before you pull the plug on it. And then the other thing to keep in mind is once you're not on Spotify, it's not like your podcast stops growing because you're still everywhere else. Spotify right now is still only between 15 and 30% of podcast listening. So it's not like you're giving up hundreds of millions of listeners. It's just a small fraction right now. And so if this is something you're thinking about, the sooner you pull the trigger, the better, um, because you'll be able to make that shift and then focus your efforts on growing on these other platforms that aren't doing the things that Spotify is doing. So that's the advice I would give if someone is thinking about shifting a considerable number of listeners off of Spotify, but they don't want to lose the audience that they've worked so hard to build. To wrap this uh, segment up a little bit, because I know we've talked a bit about Spotify, one show that's not on Spotify is The Dithering, um, new show that I started listening to with Ben Thompson and Mark Group. Uh, John Gruber. John Gruber. <laughs> I've been listening to it for a while. <laughs> um, good friends, good friends. Actually, so Ben Thompson's uh, written this newsletter for years called Stratechery and has done a podcast called Exponent. And Exponent was actually never in Spotify over these exact concerns um, where he said, yeah, they're an aggregator. They're trying to pull together this entire industry. And I don't think that that's good for the open ecosystem of podcasting. And so they kept that show out. And now um, John Gruber and Ben Thompson have now launched a paid podcast that is, I believe, $5 a month for people to listen to. And they're doing three 15 minute episodes once a week. I think the show is exceptional. I really enjoy it. But um, just to give you an idea, like there, the reason this is why we don't love it is because it actually knocks out so many alternative business models. So for a show that's very wonky in the weeds about the uh, tech space and media that's not going to have this insane audience that's going to be able to monetize off ads, especially not to the extent of where now they're getting thousands of people to pay them $5 a month. So just consider like the value of not having this all in one place is that we're able to have lots of different types of business models and different people are able to succeed in different ways. And if you want to listen to a new show that you might enjoy, I have definitely dug the dithering. So check it out. Yeah. Now you can't find that just in like Apple podcasts, right? You have to go like search Google for the dithering podcast. I think it's the dithering.fm. We'll leave a link in the show notes. Yeah. And since we don't have our podcast on Spotify, the link will actually work. There you go. Just had to throw in that last little dig there. All right. All right. I think that's a good, <laughs> good that's time to move on. on. Let's rearrange our view here for a second. That's right. Um, okay. So let's talk about transcripts. This has been a project we've been working on for quite some time, actually, in the background. We rolled out a transcripts integration with Temi. When was that? Like a year ago? Over a year ago? We, oh, we yeah. built trans over a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. We built transcripts into Buzzsprout. Uh, the reason transcripts are helpful is you can take your audio content that you worked so hard to make and turn it into a blog post or, or use it for search engine optimization and that kind of stuff. Um, but Temi recently raised their prices. So it became less ideal to use that service. So then we rolled out our own and we were using, we, we had our own transcripts built up and we were offering it as a free feature for people to test out. Uh, but it wasn't as accurate as some of the other, um, machine transcribe services. So Kevin, why don't you catch us up on what the latest iteration of Buzzsprout transcripts is and why we think in the long run, this is going to be the best solution for, for podcasters. Right. So 
Travis kind of laid out the nutshell version of what we've been struggling with for the past year and a half or so. And it's come it's snapped into focus in the past six months as soon as Temi raised their prices significantly. It used to be 10 cents a minute, another 25 cents a minute. So that's not a little price hike. That's a pretty massive price hike. It's like what? 250%. Yeah, 250%, yeah. but just crazy, you know? Um, and so we were losing our minds, tried to work with them for a long time about you can't just raise your prices that much overnight. They disagreed. And so we decided to, to shift our focus and figure out um, how we could make Buzzsprout more flexible to work with different transcription service providers because there's a lot of them. And Temi is a good one, but they they the way that they thank their customers for the, I mean, I don't want to rab rip on them, rip on them too much, but that's not a nice way to treat your customers is that um, the more and more customers that were coming to them and finding them and then they they raise their prices like that. So um, there's the, the good news is that there's other great options out there. Um, and Otter was one that really stood out to us. Their machine uh, learning technology and I guess they actually call, like technically they call it uh, just speech to text technology was was really good. It was on par or better in most cases of most of our tests than Temi. Their editor was a nicer editing experience. Um, but again, that the question becomes, are we going to create an integration that locks a bunch of Buzzsprout customers into one solution? And so we wanted to try to figure out a way, like how can we work with the best of breed uh, transcription services? Because things are changing so fast. Like there's better ones coming out all the time. And if somebody starts, you know, has a breakthrough in technology that leaps ahead of Temi or Otter or whoever else we integrate with, we want our, our customers to be able to switch to that pretty quickly as well. Um, so, and we had conversations with a couple of these companies they're all fantastic people and, and trying to do the best work. Um, but it is, they're doing a lot of R and D and so the stuff's expensive and, and I get all that. Um, anyway, where we landed was the idea that you could use whatever service that you want. So the Temi integration is still built in. And then we also built in the ability to import Otter files. So if you decide Otter's the best solution for you right now, we also have a discount code that they offered Buzzsprout users. When you log into your Buzzsprout account, click on resources, you'll see it on the right sidebar. Uh, if you want to sign up for Otter for a year, you get 20% off. Um, and then you can use their transcription service for your audio. And then when you're done, export a file, a text file, and you upload that to Buzzsprout, format it perfectly. It'll look wonderful in your Buzzsprout account. You can then copy and paste that into your blog or anywhere else. And then what building this system has let us do is that anybody else who comes out, like who's going to be the next breakout star in the transcription world? I don't know. It might be Transcriptio. Let's say Transcriptio. <laughs> whoever they are. Is that a real company? Killing it. No, it's not a real company. Okay. Don't, <laughs> don't try to Google that. But a fictional company, Transcriptio, launches next month and they have great files. Well, we can just adapt an importer so that you can import their files as well. And so that's the solution that we leaned on for Buzzsprout was that we want it to be super flexible. We believe in transcripts. We believe they're really helpful for your podcast. Um, and we believe that they're important to provide from an accessibility issue first and foremost. And then as a side benefit of making sure your podcast is accessible, you might also see some better um, SEO benefits as well. But again, we would encourage you to use transcripts for the accessibility. That's first and foremost. So whether you get an SEO bump or not, we still think it's important. Now, that said, we understand that a lot of people podcast as a hobby or as a, you know, something they just do on the side and finances are tight and transcripts do cost money. And so, you know, don't feel bad if you can't do it, um, if you can't pay for them. And so what we've also added is the ability to manually create your own transcript and then you can just copy and paste it in. So you can just open up a word processor and type out whatever you want. Or if you have a friend or uh, somebody on Fiverr or somebody, if you can find a way just to get your transcripts, written out, you can now just copy and paste them into Buzzsprout and we'll display them as transcripts as well. So those are all the reasons that we love it. We think that transcripts are, uh, are a responsible way to present audio content, like put a transcript behind it because people who are hearing disabled, like that's, that's such, that's a bummer, right? Like they want to consume your content, you're creating good content, but they have a disability, they can't consume it. Transcripts are the solution to that. And so we think they're really important. We really do believe in them. Um, and we're trying to provide you all the tools so that you have all the options in the world to be able to get a transcript attached to your podcast. Yeah, we see some uh, comments in the chat asking about pricing for Otter. Otter's got a really generous free plan. Um, but once you upgrade to a paid plan, it's just 10 bucks a month for like 
Yeah, well, their free plan, they, the, the one thing that's a bummer is they just put a limit on the number of files you can import. So they let you import three files for free. And then after that, they cut you off and you have to pay after that. But you can test it out. So take three of your podcast episodes, run them through Otter. You can get them transcribed. You can test the editor, see how you like it. If you like it, their annual plan is comes out to like, what is it, like $10 a month or something like that. And then you get a 20% discount off of that if you use your Buzzsprout code. So you can buy a whole year of transcripts basically for your podcast for right around $100. Which yeah. is really good. That's like yeah. really affordable, especially when you consider that most transcript services charge you by the minutes. Whereas this is, you sign up for the service and then it's just as many transcripts as you want to run. Right. So Yeah, so for what used to cost, you know, if you're on Temi, for what you would pay to do one episode, be about $10. Now you're going to get that for an entire month with Otter. It's a great deal. Um, I use it a lot because they have a really good app. So if I'm going for a run, I'm listening to a podcast and I have something I want to remember, I will take a little voice memo and Otter will transcribe it. So when I get back to the computer, I've got it all written out and then I just copy it into my notes app. Um, right. So I think that you know it's a great app. They're a very cool team. And I think it's going to push a lot of people to transcribe more episodes, which is great for anybody who wants to rank on Google, who wants to um, be more accessible for hearing impaired. And it's just a great thing to do for your podcast. Right. And another place you can get transcripts that we'll talk about in our next episode in two weeks. Uh, we'll have a lot more to say about this, but Descript. Descript is a cool editor and it's a text-based podcast editor. And so when you load content, you load audio into the script, it creates a transcript for you and they charge for it. So there is a, a fee for that, but it's a really good transcription. They make it easy for you to tweak it up and we'll have more comments in two weeks about how you then would take a transcript from the script and push it into Buzzsprout. And that's what we call a teaser, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was great. That was great. Uh, let's see. Uh, if you're watching this live, we are going to do some Q&A at the end. So think about your question, put your question in a comment, and then at the end, once we finish the episode, we'll come back to those. Just want to kind of leave that as a placeholder. All right. Let's talk about Podcast Addict. Albin, do you want to launch this segment here? Yeah, sure. All right. So there's been a lot of news um, that's kind of gotten overshadowed a little bit by the Joe Rogan stuff, but... Podcast Addict has, for the third time um, in the last six months, been kicked out of the Google Play Store uh, for linking to podcasts. And, um, you know, there's been a ton of people talking about this. Um, so to give a little bit of context of what happened, um, all the podcast apps generally link out to the websites for the podcast they list. They don't host these shows. They're just listing them so that people can find them. Um, when the coronavirus pandemic hit, uh, Google really cranked up their algorithms to check for content that was, um, talking about like fake cures or was just preying on people or were scammy, which apparently have just been a ton. And in doing that, they have started catching apps and saying, Hey, you were linking to the scammy website because some podcasts are scammy. And so they kicked a bunch of podcasts out. But this is concerning because Podcast Addict is the number one rated and most downloaded podcast player on all of Android. Well, coincidentally, not, I mean, not, maybe not coincidentally, who knows? Um, at the same time, Google has been doing so much more with their own player. The Google Podcast Player has been gaining a ton of listeners has been doing really well. It's been well-received. They've launched Google Podcast Manager. They've been doing quite a bit. And so while it may not be nefarious, at the same time that Google is pushing more into the space, Podcast Addict has found themselves kicked out of the Google Play Store multiple times for a week plus. Um, so that's laying a little bit of the you know, groundwork. What have you guys been reading about this? What have you been thinking? So I think the thing that, that was alarming to me when I, when I saw this news was one, it doesn't seem like Google is playing fair. Uh, 
especially when you consider that, you know, something we talked about before the show, they didn't kick their own app out of the Play Store for hosting the same podcast that got Podcast Addict kicked out. But uh, the other thing that makes me think about is, well, who, who, what, what is a podcast app? It's, it's not when you submit your podcast to an app and they accept it, you know, if you do anything illegal, if you play Ariana Grande songs without permission, like the lawyers don't go after the podcast app. They go after the podcaster because they're the ones that originated the content. And so treating apps like podcast addict, essentially not just as a place that you can go and listen to other people's content, but as the host of the content itself, I mean, that has been that has been a conversation with social media platforms like Facebook. Like, should they be held accountable for videos and stuff that's posted to their platform or not? Um, you know, how do we kind of manage this whole thing with who's responsible for what? So that's that's the part of the conversation that's interesting to me is these larger players are they going to start making rules for third party apps that are delivering an exceptional product and listening experience that are different than their own rules to you know, for their own advantage. Um, so that was kind of my, my first reaction was, I really hope this isn't what's happening and, and a precursor to what's going to happen down the road. Yeah. You can understand why they may have gotten kicked out of the store for linking to these the first time. Um, you know, this is anecdotal, but we spend money on Google through Google ads. And I've seen in the last three months, way more ad rejections in a week than I've had in the entire five years we've been on Google ads. And the reason that's happened is because they are getting so much garbage thrown at them. They had to start filtering it. So this is me trying to spend money with Google and they're still flagging that stuff going. I mean, they would flag a video like this and say, Oh, it is this objectionable material stuff that is like not even close has gotten flagged for us. So I know that they are catching things that they don't want to catch. Like they don't want, they want us to be able to spend money and they have flagged that out of an abundance of caution. I, so I get that. Like what Travis is saying, the thing that really kind of stings about it is they're not, this has not happened once or twice. This has happened three times. It takes forever for it to get resolved for podcast addict. It's not like this is, some guy, you know, working out of his basement and he has like two downloads. This is a massive app at the same time that the Google branded version has not been hit with the same uh, restrictions or at least, I mean, maybe that they're smart enough that they built the app in a way that it wouldn't get flagged. But unfortunately, Podcast Addict is not play does not seem to be playing on an equal playing field because they are not able to look over and, you know, they're not able to tap a engineer on the shoulder and say, Hey man, uh, what do we do to not get flagged by this new algorithm that's running around, you know, banning apps? Yeah. I don't, do you guys know when they ban it from the store? It doesn't like pull it off of everybody's phone who had already downloaded it. Right? No. That's new just, downloads, right? Yeah. It only stops the new downloads. Yeah. Um, but podcast addict and writing about it on, line they've said like this takes a week to get back in a week in the podcast industry right now when you're the number one app and google is has a app that is quickly catching up to you is devastating that's not like oh that was a little bit of an inconvenience like if we actually got you know bus spread actually has built other apps in the past if one of those apps had gotten kicked off for a week it wouldn't have been the end of the world it'd been very frustrating but this is like the critical moment for Podcast Addict. And yet they are spending weeks talking to bots on Twitter. I mean, literally they're talking to the Google, the Google Play um, support on Twitter. And it's just a bot responding saying, has your question been resolved? Yeah. And they're like, no, please, for the love no. of God, get me back in. <laughs> yeah, we know that pain. Google is terrible. When things go wrong, it's, it's like impossible. We pay for Google apps for our email addresses and our support email box this was like six months ago support email box just got locked they just like no nah, looks something suspicious going on we're locking it so we have thousands of customers who are trying to email us and you know questions or help or whatever they want to talk to us we can't get the emails it's it's 
insane and it's frustrating. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, the answer for us is we're going to find another email provider. You can't just go find another Google Play to distribute your app on. And you can't just port your app from an Android app to iOS. Like that's like, you know, a massive amount of work. And I, I get th that developers who want to specialize in one platform. Uh, it's just unfortunate. The same thing does happen on the Apple side. Uh, there are Apple iOS developers who have had the same stories about their apps getting uh, rejected and constantly or pulled from the store for certain reasons. It's, it's, it's part of what you sign up for when that's the business that you're going to go into. I don't think it's a good part of it. I don't think Google's doing it intentionally. Um, but they've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of apps in their store and they've got to build some rules and some logic. And sometimes that logic fails. Um, and it does look bad, especially the same week that they launch a competing app. But it's been a bit know. of an overstatement to say it looks bad. Yeah. But you know, here, let's loop this back to what we were talking about in the beginning. This is the yeah. difference between closed ecosystems and walled gardens versus open and free and independent. This is exactly what can happen. What we, we talk about, you know, when Spotify becomes the place that people go to listen to consume apps and then Spotify decides they don't want you, don't, they don't like your show for whatever reason. This is what you're talking about. Yeah. And it wouldn't be that Spotify is doing something nefarious is that you are not super important to them. And so their algorithm scoops you up in the group, in the group of shows that get kicked out and because they're doing something that makes sense to them. And is a good thing that they're saying, Hey, we don't want all this scammy fake coronavirus stuff in the app. And so they're kicking it out. But I guarantee you one thing in that future, uh, Spotify sees we're about to kick the Joe Rogan experience out of Spotify. And someone goes, wait a second, didn't we pay like $200 million for that? Don't kick that out of the platform because yeah. when a plat when an entire ecosystem is built around a platform, all of the value of that ecosystem runs through the platform and all of the profits roll their way. And they naturally make decisions that are great for the platform and they are not really worrying about is this devastating to one of the little guys who has their show with us? And Google isn't super worried about podcast addicts. Like there's probably uh, employees that feel terrible and really care, but they can't just get the entire company to shift on a dime so that they can get this, you know, indie app back in the store. But I guarantee if Google podcast got kicked out, the company as a whole could shift on a dime to get it back in because that's just how companies are built so that they are looking out for their own interests. And so when you give one person the power and you give them all the control, eventually they, do, they naturally do things that are to their interest. Yep. All right. So if you're an Android user and you haven't checked out podcast addict, please go try to find them and download them. And let's try to help recover yeah. from being half the, the uh, Google Play Store last week. Let's bump those numbers. Tell your friends, podcast addict. Good luck. Yeah, guys. and that's and that's not a charity call either. Like they probably have one of the better podcast players available in the Android Store. So you're probably going to upgrade your whole podcast listening experience. All right, one more segment, guys. We're one more, and we're doing up. some Q and A. Some Q and A. Uh, Alvin, yeah, I can make you guys small. <laughs> This is exactly, wait, go back, Kevin. That was, that is exactly what we're talking about with Spotify. <laughs> Kevin has the control shocker. Which one of us is the big, the big screen? Well, if I had the control, I would probably do something like this, right? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we're we're invisible. <laughs> All right. Um, Albin, do you actually want to, since I'm going to do a lot of talking on this one, do you want to intro this one as well? Since you were the kind of the yeah, primary give, contact give at first. The, Give me the name of the um of the festival again, the Outlier Outlier Podcast, Podcast Festival. Festival. Yep. Okay. All right. So this week, um, or last week, there was the Outlier Podcast Festival. A lot of these festivals have gone online that they used to do things in purpose or in purpose. <laughs> <laughs> we can just hit restart on that. I am dum 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 dum. We do that whole All right. Time. And all right. So last week was the Outlier Podcast Festival. Um, these are a lot of festivals that used to be done in person and now are being done online. And one of the people who was asked to speak uh, was Travis. 
So, you know, like we normally do when one of us gives a talk, we kind of wanted to run through a little bit about what um, Travis talked about. So Travis, do you want to give us a little bit of an idea of what your show or what your talk was about and maybe give us some of the high points? Yeah, for sure. So it was, it was fun actually. So I enjoyed it. It was one of those things that like at the last minute we were given the opportunity to do this and I was pumped about it because I love doing these kind of things. And so my talk was 10 ish because I ended up talking about more than 10 uh, tools to really level up your podcast. Uh, and the, the reason I really enjoy doing it is because I experiment with all kinds of tools all the time, uh, just trying to figure out how do we make our Buzzsprout shows better? How do uh, you know we teach tools and, and do tutorials and stuff on our YouTube channel? And so I was able to go back through and think, OK, what are the the 10-ish tools that I would recommend to somebody if they were like, OK, I have a little bit of money to invest in either growing my audience, growing uh, you know the the production value of my podcast, or even branching into some monetization strategies, what would you recommend? And so that was kind of the the framing for this talk was these are uh, pro level tools that are kind of beyond the entry level or the beginner stage. Once you've really committed to your podcast and you're ready to level it up, what should you do? And so I divided it into a couple different sections. The first section was tools specifically for helping the audio quality or the production value of your podcast episodes. And so one of them, the first one that I got to mention was Hindenburg. Hindenburg uh, Journalist Pro is the audio editing software that uh, Kevin initially got me hooked on. And now I can't, I can't go back. I can't go back to a world before Hindenburg because I just love uh, the software so much. And essentially what it is, is it's all the pro level features that you would get in Logic Pro X, Adobe Audition, Reaper, which are like music studio quality audio editing platforms. But unless you're mixing like a Kanye West album, you don't need 90% of the features that are in that software. So Hindenburg says, okay, we're going to take all those awesome features that podcasters need, and we're going to put it in this really intuitive interface so you can make great podcast episodes, even if you're not an audio engineer. So that's why Hindenburg Journalist Pro is, is so great. Um, I've also found myself saving a lot of time editing episodes. So my editing flow has sped up just because of the way that the interface works and how intuitive it is moving stuff around. Um, I really appreciate the attention to detail there. And then you couple that with the publish feature, which allows you to push your final episode straight from Hindenburg into Buzzsprout. And you can even run it through Magic Mastering, which is our, our newest feature we just rolled out. Um, that's all one motion now. So instead of it taking 30-ish minutes to do the mastering and using a third-party app like Alphonic and uploading it and all that kind of stuff, it's two to three hours a week of, or a month of my time that I get back now just from using Hindenburg. So that was one tool that I got to talk about. Um, another one that I talked about was Squadcast, which is the long-distance remote uh, podcast recording software that we really like, that we recommend. Um, we're not using it for this episode because we're using StreamYard to do the live stream. But when it's just the three of us and we're doing our episode, that's our app of choice. We love Squadcast, love what they're doing over there. And then as far as growth strategies, some of the tools I talked about were uh, not necessarily the tools that you would think of. So one of them was overcast ads. So uh, a lot of people, when they think, oh, I'm going to start running ads to promote my podcast to grow my audience. They, they think about Facebook, they think about Google, but the problem with those kind of platforms is you're trying to shift someone's behavior like 180 degrees. So on Facebook, it's like, hey, I'm catching up with my nieces and nephews at their birthday party. Oh, there's that funny, you know, stand up comic that's now everywhere. Oh, and here's an ad telling me to go listen to 45 minutes of a podcast conversation. Like, it's just really hard to get people to shift into that frame of mind. And so with Overcast, you're able to promote your podcast directly to people that are listening to a podcast. So it's like in the act of listening to their favorite podcast, your podcast shows up as something else that they can check out. And so we've had a lot of success whenever we use um, Overcast ads to promote our own podcasts, just paying like, you know, between one and three dollars per subscriber. Um, and so it's really cool that you're able to track that and, and see your podcast grow. So if you have some money to spend on ads, we think Overcast is probably the best way to do that. And then as far as you know, just marketing your show and continuing to, to uh, put your best foot forward so when you do promote your show, people stick around, 
we talked about the importance of making a good first impression that when somebody shows up to your podcast, if you have lackluster podcast artwork, then that's going to tell them that uh, their, their podcast episode is probably going to sound as good as their artwork looks. And so if you have some money to really plus up your artwork, that's a fantastic investment to grow your audience long term. And the service that we really like is 99designs uh, because it's tailored for people that aren't graphic designers and don't necessarily know what they want the artwork to be at the end. So that's those are the two things that I really like about it because the way that sites like Fiverr or Upwork or some of these other sites where you connect with a graphic designer to do work for you is you basically kind of already need to know what you want. You need to find a designer that can do that work at a high level. And then there's a lot of back and forth and there's no guarantee at the end that you're going to be happy with what you get. So there's a lot of risk on you shelling out money to hopefully get something that you like. But with 99designs, the way that they do it is they really shift the focus more towards the designers coming up with their concepts. And then you're choosing between 40, 50, 60 different designs. Uh, and so we've done it twice for our own podcast. We did it with How to Start a Podcast. We recently used 99designs for podcasting Q&A for that new artwork. And we're really happy with both of those. And the investment that we made was on par with what you would give to a professional graphic designer anyways. And so it was nice having all these different options to choose from and be able to iterate on. So uh, so we really like 99designs if you're looking to really step up your podcast. And then the, the newest uh, monetization platform that we've started encouraging people to check out and see if it's a good fit for them is Podcorn. The reason that we like Podcorn is that is not because they're necessarily doing anything that makes you know host red ads crazy lucrative, but they make it really easy to connect with kind of the mid to lower tier sponsors, right? And so typically when you're trying to do a sponsor or, or negotiate with an ad network, you have to have a lot of downloads. You need to be connected to a podcast network that's negotiating hundreds of thousands of downloads to get access to these sponsors. And if you don't have that, let's say, just say that you have 50,000 downloads an episode and you're trying to reach out to these sponsors. Well, who do you talk to? Who is actually making the decision to spend money on podcast ads? So Podcorn just kind of takes all of that and really simplifies it. So brands and companies will say, hey, we have this product. We're trying to promote it on podcasts of all sizes. If you think you're a good fit, send us a proposal. And so you're able to directly apply um, and you're able to really be creative about how you incorporate it as well. So you can say, I'm going to do a pre-roll ad where I talk about it for 30 seconds at the beginning of the episode. I'm going to review your product and spend 30 minutes talking about it. Or I'm going to interview your co-founder and have them on as a guest. And then at the end, encourage people to go and check it out. So there's a lot of different ways too that you can negotiate your own value as the content creator to, to potentially get a more lucrative sponsorship deal. And in the cut that Podca Podcorn takes is actually relatively small compared to what you would see with these matchmaking services, which typically range between 30 and 50%. I believe Podcorn is 10% or less. So if that is something that you want to push into, um, doing host red ads and trying to find sponsors, then that's that's a, a platform that we have our eye on that we think has some upside. Yep. So one of the questions we got over on YouTube was, uh, where's the episode of the top 10 things to grow your podcast? Where Where is this... Um, you know, where is this talk living, Travis, and how do we get access to it? So we're recording this on Wednesday, May 20th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, May 20th. That video, that talk will go live on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to watch it there. Um, in addition to that, if you want to go and watch some of the other outlier talks, because there were a ton of really great sessions, um, you can basically do a pay what you can sign up to get access to the entire vault of all the recordings. And so I think for as little as $5, you can get access to lot, you know, some really great people, some really fantastic experts in the podcasting space, uh, sharing their, their thoughts and, and how to really grow your podcast. But if you just want to see my talk, my little 28 minute spiel, it'll be on our Buzzsprout YouTube channel later today. Awesome. All right. well, thanks, Travis. That's a, you know, I, we love all these uh, festivals and all of these, um, things that people are putting together. We're not able to hang out in person, but there's a lot of cool podcasting festivals. There's some more coming up in the next few weeks. So if that's something you're interested in, keep an eye out. And, uh, 
you know, I think we're, we're ready to wrap this episode. We are. We are indeed. So if you're listening to this and you have not yet joined the Buzzsprout podcast community on Facebook, you are missing out because we just have a fantastic group over there. And uh, we're always sharing tips and things that we're learning and doing Facebook lives like this. And so if you are looking to connect with other podcasters, if you are looking for a community that can help you and partner with you as you grow your podcast audience, uh, that is a fantastic group to be a part of. And if you haven't yet gone over to Podchaser and left us a glowing five-star review telling us about how we're your favorite podcast, you can do that simply by clicking the link in the show notes and uh, and we reply to every single one of them, so, which is also a really cool part of Podchaser. But that is it for the recorded portion of the podcast. If you want to join the Q&A, then in two weeks, you'll just have to be aware that we will be doing these live. <laughs> and so uh, check Facebook, check YouTube to jump into the Q&A. And uh, yeah, for all of you guys that are live right now, after we wrap the episode, we will jump into your questions. But for everybody else, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. All right. So we're going to do some Q&A for everybody. We got a lot of good questions. One, uh, Albin looks very upset. No, that's just my face. <laughs> Hey Jordan. Hey Jordan. Um, friend but, of the show. Friend of the show. All right. Uh, so we go through. I say let's just take them one. Um, like you know, Kevin, you grab one. Travis grabs one. I grab one. We just, you know, we we serve them up to whoever may, it might be most excited to talk about it and try to hit them in like thirty seconds so we can do as many questions as we can. Um, if you're on Facebook, you and you want us to actually see your name, uh, make sure you actually drop uh kevin put in some instructions on how so we can actually see your name on youtube just leave a comment we can see who you are and uh we will post all the questions up on the screen all, all right. right so let me let me throw some questions at you guys i think travis you're probably good at this one my show will predominantly be interview style what currently is the most efficient way to create the video element for the show or for youtube specifically all right so alvin why are you <laughs> Alvin, that's your excited face. Um, so there's two ways you can do it. If you're in quarantine right now with the rest of the world and you're not doing it in person, then you can use any any uh, recording software that includes a video element. That could be Zoom. That could be Skype. You can even use Squadcast. That's what I would recommend is you use Squadcast. And then you would just use some kind of screen recording software to capture that. So uh, if you're using Squadcast to do your interview or talking to your co-host, you can use QuickTime, you can use um, Ecamm Call Recorder, you can use a, a bunch of other uh, softwares. And you basically have that be your video file that you upload. If right. you're doing it in person, you can just set up a webcam, you can set up your, your uh, mobile phone, taking the video, uh, and then sync that with your audio and upload that as a video file. So that's what I would do. I would, If you're going to show your entire episode, I would stray away from doing the audiogram strategy where you just have like the waveform against a still graphic, that's not gonna perform well as far as growing a YouTube audience. So I would find a way to incorporate some kind of face to camera, um, whether you're doing it virtually or in person. Yeah. What do you think of StreamYard? <laughs> you mentioned everything except StreamYard, which we're using. <laughs> <laughs> we are on is, that, is that why you were laughing? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, obviously this guy just set it up for you to talk about what we're using right now. And instead you're like, ah, this isn't any good. <laughs> Streamyard is fine. Streamyard is good. I've this is the my first experience with Streamyard, so like I haven't put it through the paces yet, which is why I didn't recommend it. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, you can also you can, for lives, but you can also do it set it to record only, and then you can do whatever you want with that recording. Uh, and just to show you, when we film stuff that's not live, this is the camera that we use in the Buzzsprout Studio. It's called the Canon EOS M50, and here's why it's so awesome because this little screen flips out and then you can turn it around. So you can see yourself while you're filming. So it's a great little vlogging camera. We use that all the time. Yes. They're, they're not too expensive. You can get them refurbished off the Canon refurb store for about $350. Just be aware they have a 30 minute record limit. That's the yeah. only drawback. Not great. But that's, a, that's a DSLR thing. Yep. All right, Kev, service right. up some questions. Ready for another one. Let's give, Kev, let's give Travis this other softball. There's another one in there. Oh. Travis. This one? What mic are you using? Oh, well, we need to overlay some some soft, uh, sad violin music. Uh, I am using the the now extinct uh, ATR2100 from Audio-Technica. So I am on the road currently um, 
staying with family. And so rather than bring my $300 microphone and boom arm setup contraption, uh, the ATR 2100s are like my go-to for when I'm heading out on the road, traveling, because I can just throw it in my backpack, whatever, and it's good to go. And then I'm actually just using, I'm not using like a boom arm. This is a microphone stand. I don't know if, if you go full screen, screen, Kevin, I can kind of show it off a little bit. It's just a $25 microphone stand from Amazon and it's just connected. So the reason I did this is I can just sit on the floor wherever, like I don't have to be sitting at a desk. I don't have to clamp it to anything. It's just mounted to the floor and I can put it right next to my face. So that's my current setup with uh, my microphone. Now, if you like this microphone and you want something similar, then tomorrow you'll have to watch a video on our YouTube channel where we recommend a new microphone for people that are looking for something under $100 that's really great. Albin, yeah. you were the star of that video. Yeah, so this one, the one Travis has is no longer available. There's a, it's updated version, the ATR 2100X. We put that against some other mics and it's not our top recommendation now. We would say Samson Q2U is probably the best mic for new podcasters. It can plug right into your computer. It's 60 bucks. It's built like a rock. It's a great mic. Uh, we highly recommend it and has a little bit nicer stand than the one Travis. Um, the stand that comes with it is nicer than the one that came with Travis's mic. So Samson Q2U is a comparable microphone and we think it's great. Okay. All right, Alvin, while you're you're on the mic, just why don't you run with this one? <laughs> Lord. <laughs> Lord is trolling me. Albin looks very upset. Is Spreaker a good option for a host? Well, probably the reason I'm upset is because you're asking me questions about our competitor. <laughs> um, I mean, we know the team at Spreaker. They're all very kind people. We really like them. We run into them at all the conferences. I personally would recommend Buzzsprout as a podcast host. Um, they're doing great things over there. Their uh, video content that Travis Albritton does is great. Kevin is the head of... <laughs> Uh, product and he makes all the decisions and he seems to make the best decisions in the world. So I would say uh, bus Prime might be a good place for you to check out. All right. I'll take this one. Does Hindenburg offer a good discount or some sort of once a year discount? So Hindenburg is um, like traditional software license. You buy it, you pay for it once and then you don't really have to pay anymore uh, unless you want to upgrade at certain points. So I think they do various upgrades that are all free, like, you know, point releases, but then major versions, there might be an upgrade fee. Um, but it's not a monthly fee. It's not a yearly fee. And there is a discount code for that one-time purchase in your Buzzsprout account. So log in, click on resources, and you'll see the discount code on the right-hand side. And we, if you go through Buzzsprout, you get a 90-day free trial instead of the, the standard 30-day that you can get on their website. That is true. All right, what do we got here? If you start a podcast, how many days a week and for how long would you do it? Well, I would say um, most people, the answer is one day a week because you're kind of building yourself into somebody's life that they kind of expect. Hey, Monday mornings, I uh, go for my run and then the podcast is there. You want to kind of fit into the habits in people's lives. Um, so once a week is not overloading you and you're able to put out consistent content. For how long would you do it? I'm going to answer two different ways because I know you're really saying how long should the episode be. It should be as long as it needs to be. I think keep trying to keep it shorter is a very good thing for new podcasters because it relieves your, you from doing all the editing work. It's small, less editing work. And you have the benefit of you're probably going to cut yourself off before you ramble for too long. But I also want to throw this in. How long would you do it? If you're going to start a podcast, commit to a couple months of consistent episodes before you give up because you will not believe how much better you get after you've been podcasting for a couple months. By your eighth episode, you're going to go, oh, I feel so much more comfortable than I used to. Oh, I'm so much faster at this than I used to be. And you'll start to actually get some listeners who might be responding. So everybody is bad in the beginning. It's hard in the beginning. It's hard to get a ton of listeners in the beginning, but it all gets easier. So stick with it. We wish you the best. Okay. All right. Um, Jordan has a quick question about Outlier Festival, having trouble watching the rewatching the videos. Do you know if there's another place or website I can find those? Travis might. Um, I imagine she could also email you directly, Travis. You might be able to help her out. Yep. Travis at buzzsprout.com. We'll figure it out. 
Um, my guess is that's going to that's going to be a, an email to their support team, um, just to make sure that you can get access to those videos. It did just end like a few days ago, so it's it's totally possible that they haven't uploaded all of those yet. Okay. All right, and then let's just do one more. Let's see. Should you have a podcast show notes page as well as posting the transcripts into a new blog post, or do you think the show notes and the blog transcript should be the same blog page? What do you think, Travis? Oh, I was going to say this is an Albin question. Uh, oh, yeah, Albin, so, yeah, sure. yeah the, the show notes and the blog and, and transcript serve two different purposes in my mind, at least the way that I think about them. The show notes are there as a, as a guide or a tool that complements your podcast content. So whenever you mention a resource or you you have like some main points, let's say that you're teaching something and you have five things that you emphasize five, here on the screen, five things, five things you emphasize. Then in your show notes, you want to outline those five things so someone can quickly reference them um, to really basically have an additional resource that complements your podcast content. The transcript is there as a like a replacement for the audio. So if somebody just wants to read it instead of listening to it, they can read it there. Um, that, that's really the, the big benefit of having a blog transcript. And I'll let Albin speak to the search engine angle of this. Yeah. So the standard rule for having stuff on a blog, if you're actually just trying to rank in Google is you want to have all the relevant information on one URL. So we want to keep it all together. Um, one of the things I noticed this question's got is, um, actually creating blog posts. So if you're actually rewriting the transcript as a blog post, then that's kind of a separate thing. And maybe you would embed the episode on top. If you're really just doing the transcript, I think having it on the same URL as the um, podcast show notes is perfectly fine. Have the show notes at the top because that's probably a couple paragraphs max, maybe some bullet points. And then you say, and you can read the entire transcript below. Um, so that would be my recommendation. That's the way that um, coincidentally Buzzsprout handles your transcripts and your show notes on the podcast websites that we build for you. Um, so that's what we would recommend. And as always start podcasting and, uh, you know, as you're podcasting, you, these things will start to become pretty, these decisions will become easier to make. You won't feel like you're taking a shot in the dark. Eventually you'll see everyone finds me through the episodes and no one's really reading the transcripts or the blog post. Maybe that's what you find. And so you go, oh, I don't really need to put all the effort into that. So I think really lean into the podcast. Um, I don't know how long you've been already been podcasting this, so maybe you already have that experience. Yep. All right. Well, we are going to get back to creating software and marketing software and creating content. Thank you all for joining us. It was fun. Uh, Again, we uh, just playing with this idea of going live as we record Buzzcast every other week. Um, and I think we'll keep playing with it, but I'm not sure if we're going to commit to being a live podcast every other Wednesday or not. Um, but let us know what you think. If you enjoyed it, if you want us to commit, let us know in the comments. Um, thanks for joining us. Keep podcasting. Any final words, guys? No, you stole them right out of my mouth. Keep podcasting. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for watching all these goofy live streams. We appreciate you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> See you later. See you.